Good morning, brothers and sisters. As we return to the Wednesday portion of this week's study and progress in this part of the article that Uriah Smith had written, shall we ask our Heavenly Father for his direction and his guidance. As we open the word of the Lord, as we consider carefully that which those examples which are given us, shall we seek to come to understand so that we might better know that which the Lord would have us to understand at this time in our history. Shall we now ask for his guidance in prayer? Loving Father in heaven, we thank you for the many blessings that you are providing. We thank you for all that you are doing in our lives, for the tests and the trials, for all that is occurring so that your will may be done. We ask, Father, for your forgiveness of anything that we have done that has not been right. We ask also, Father, for your blessing upon those in this meeting and those that may view this later. Direct us now, assist us, so that we might come to understand more clearly that which you would have us to know. Help us. May our minds be open. May the Spirit guide us. May your angels protect us. May your will be done. For this we thank you, and this we praise you, now and always, in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Now, we began yesterday considering this verse. Thus shall he do in the most strongholds with a strange God whom he shall acknowledge and increase with glory. And he shall cause them to rule over many and shall divide the land for gain. Smith's comment begins the system of paganism, which had been introduced into France as exemplified in the worship of the idol set up in the person of the goddess of reason and regulated by a heathen ritual, which had been enacted by the national assembly for the use of the French people continued in force till the appointment of Napoleon to the Provisional Consulate of France in 1799. The adherents the of this strange religion occupied the fortified places, the strongholds of the nation, as expressed in the verse. Now, of course, there are some that think that Smith was a prophet. I am not of their camp. I do not believe that Smith was a prophet. I understand fully that Mrs. White has stated that his book should be seen as, quote, God's helping hand. Yet what we are seeing here that happened in France at the end of that century became more of full effect by the time we get into the 20th century with that that took place in Russia. So the paganism that was introduced in France became the paganism that we would see in Russia. Any other thoughts or comments on that? Yeah. So, um, well, we know, of course, as we've talked about, that this, that this France is prophecy in Revelation 11. But here, of course, this wouldn't apply to France. Okay. And, and you know, we already looked at this verse in detail um, that, you know, that this is actually talking about. So when we're dealing with the it says the papal power he shall do most uh, he shall do in the most strongholds we looked at this this was the uh, uh, against the the most strongholds or against right. places of refuge right so which we we take as god's word so this is an attack upon god's word that we see in revelation chapter 11 but here this the way that he's introducing this or the way that he's addressing this has to do with France as worshiping a idol is is completely different than what the, the Hebrew would actually be talking about in, in that context. Right. So he's he's going to use false worship to attack God's word. Right. Now Smith continues, but that which serves to identify the application of this prophecy to France perhaps as clearly as any other particular, is the statement made in the last clause of the verse, namely, that they should divide the land for gain. Previous to the revolution, the landed property of France was owned by a few landlords in immense estates. These estates were required by law to remain undivided so that no heirs or creditors could partition them. But the revolution knows no law. And in the anarchy that now reigned, 
as noted also in the 11th of Revelation, the titles of the nobility were abolished and their lands disposed of in small parcels for the benefit of the public exchequer. The government was in need of funds, and these large landed estates were confiscated and sold at auction in parcels to suit purchasers. The historian thus records this unique transaction. The confiscation of two-thirds of the landed property of the kingdom, which arose from the decrees of the convention against the emigrants, the clergy, and persons convicted at the revolutionary tribunals, placed funds worth above 700 million pounds sterling at the disposal of the government. Now, no matter how we look at that, that is a lot of money. When did ever an event transpire and in what country fulfilling a prophecy more completely than this? As the nation began to come to itself, a more rational religion was demanded and the heathen ritual was abolished. The historian thus describes that event. A third and bolder measure was the discarding of the heathen ritual and the reopening of the churches for Christian worship. And of this, the credit was wholly Napoleon's, <clears throat> who had to contend with the philosophic prejudices of almost all of his colleagues. He, in his conversations with them, made no attempts to represent himself a believer in Christianity, but stood only on the necessity of providing the people with the regular means of worship wherever it is meant to have a state of tranquility. The priests who chose to take the oath of fidelity to the government were readmitted to their functions, and this wise measure was followed by the adherence of not less than 20,000 of these ministers of religion who had hitherto languished in the prisons of France. Lockhart's Life of Napoleon, Volume 1, page 154. It's kind of interesting that Smith shifts quite a bit between different volumes about this period to support different points that he wishes to make. Thus terminated the reign of terror and the infidel revolution. Out of its ruins rose Bonaparte to guide the tumult to his own elevation, place himself at the head of the French government, and strike terror to the hearts of the nations. So is well, Smith, go ahead. So when we started studying um smith's articles here which which did we start with which were like we started with chapter 12 right uh which which one did we start with first like what verse what uh i just don't remember we had a specific date that we started of his articles do you remember which one because now he's to verse 40 but we started chapter 12 and this is what the date here is. Is this in March 21st, this one? 20, is... 21st of March of 1871. Yeah. And then he's going to get to chapter 12 on the 16th of May of 1871. Is that was it? 16th of May? Yes. Wasn't there one dealing with some s symbolic date that we had? Um, yeah. <clears throat> this one coming 49 or 50 days after this article was on the 25th day of the second month of the biblical year. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. Okay. I was just trying to remember that. Sorry about that. Interruption. No, no, no. Okay. Yeah, we, it's, Cause we're going to come because he's going to, so there's going to be, uh, you know, we got, uh, we're going to start in verse 40. So we got these six verses left. I'm, I'm just kind of thinking ahead anyway. Okay, sorry. No, our, <clears throat> our situation, when we looked at this with the 12th chapter, <clears throat> was it lined up with the 25th day of the second month on the biblical calendar, the rabbinic calendar, and the Islamic calendar. Yeah, and it was May what? May 16 on the Gregorian calendar, 4th of May on the Julian calendar. So just dealing with some symbolic dates. So so we missed our study on Sunday, right? Because I was in the mountains. And uh, so yesterday we had uh, study number 252. 
and that happened to fall on July 23rd. So you didn't intentionally miss Sunday so that you could line up 723 with 252, right? No, I didn't. <laughs> Just, you know, the 2520 starts in 723 BC. So that's kind of an interesting uh, uh, symbols there that aligned. <clears throat> yeah, that, that wasn't e- even on my mind. Yeah, well, I know. Yeah, I realize that. Okay, anyway, we got to move to verse 40, I guess. Now, now was there anything else about verse 39? Because we had gone through it. Um, right. We're going to run into some real problems when we get to verse 40 with Uriah Smith. So here's verse 40. And at the time of the end shall the king of the south push at him. And the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots and with horsemen and with many ships. And he shall enter into the countries and shall overflow and pass over. So as we begin our to segue into verses 40 to 45, here is Smith's presentation looking at this on verse 40. So at the time of the end, we've identified, shall the king of the south, paganism, push at him, and the king of the north, shall come against him, question mark, king of the south, like a whirlwind, with chariots and with horsemen and with many ships. And he shall enter into countries and shall overflow and pass over. Here is Smith in this first paragraph setting up his premise. After a long interval, the king of the south and the king of the north again appear on the stage of action. We have met with nothing to indicate that we are to look to any different localities for these powers from those which shortly after the death of Alexander constituted respectively the southern and the northern divisions of his empire. The king of the south was at that time Egypt, and the king of the north was Syria, including Thrace and Asia Minor. Egypt is still, by common agreement, the king of the south, while the territory which at first constituted the king of the north, has been for the past 400 years wholly included with the dominations of the Sultan of Turkey. To Egypt and Turkey, then, we must look for a fulfillment of the verse before us. Now, here is Smith's Eastern question. Here is Smith's premise that we should consider his point relative to Turkey, even though Turkey has nothing to do with Daniel 2, Daniel 7, Daniel 8, Daniel 10, or even before this in Daniel 11. Why is he choosing to become <clears throat> so anti-biblical? Well, he's simply following Josiah Lich. So, he he is presenting what he understands as the pioneer position. Okay. Right. And now Josiah Litch uh, published it in, um, well, he's published it in a few different places. Uh, I'm looking right now to address to the public and especially the clergy, which was published in, when was this published? I'm not sure. It doesn't give the publishing date. But but he, he's dealing, uh, if I look in prophetic expositions, here, I'll do it there, because it's, so we got um, in prophetic expositions, volume two, he's going to the king of the south shall push at him, at whom the answer is the subject of prophecy in the preceding verses, the revolutionary government of France. So that was the view of just Josiah Lich. Okay. Now, we, we had gone through this before. But a lot of this stuff that um, Josiah Litch, a lot of stuff that Smith is quoting from are actually direct quotes from Josiah Litch quoting Lockhart and, and so forth. So Smith himself is actually just quoting Josiah Litch. Okay. For the most part. I mean, he's obviously putting some of his own wor- words in there. But he went through Josiah Litch's articles, I believe, and then just wrote out his explanation from Josiah Litch. All right. Now, so, I mean, we have the criticism of Smith. Why is he doing this? 
but this is, you know, Smith isn't doing something unique. That is, he's not coming up with these ideas on his own. And, and, and he doesn't generally have original ideas. There's not much that you can see in what he's done that is his own take on things. Um, so he's not really looking for new light. He's looking to establish old light. Now, of course, if he had looked at Miller, Miller would have a different view. So he's not telling us the process in which why he decided these different views or that different views exist. You know, when it says Egypt is still by common agreement, the king of the south, I'm not sure that that matters that common agreement occurs. Plus, also, he says we have met with nothing to indicate that we are to look at any different localities, which, in fact, we have had many things that would indicate we're not going to be looking literally at Egypt. Right. We, we've moved into the end of paganism and the rise of the papacy. So if we're going to be looking at the king of the south, we'd have to be looking at who is spiritually the king of the south. And as we pointed out, if Egypt, Sodom and Egypt, symbolize France, then it would make no sense to apply literal Egypt here to the king of the south, or the king of the south to literal Egypt. This is a common... This other power. What's that? This there seems to be a common error that people are taking symbolic stuff and applying it literally. Things that are symbolic and applying it literally mm -hmm. instead of you know lining it up with the historical truth applications. Yeah, so so we have a principle. Uh, I'm just tr trying to find the verse so that I quote it correctly. That's the word. Something to the effect, you know, first. How's that? How's that verse go? That's basically first you interpret something earthly and then something spiritual. Um, do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Because I've always just kind of paraphrased the verse, but I want to get it. Anybody know what verse I'm talking about? Where you first? I'm just trying to think of the words um, that are used, and I can't think of it. Is it where we draw the idea? What is it? God shows us the end from the beginning of something. something well, something. no, I, well, it's sort of, but this one is first that which is is uh, literal, and then that which is spiritual. But I think different words are being used. Um, like it's not going to be figurative. Uh, it's First Corinthians fifteen, I think. First Corinthians fifteen. Okay. Chapter forty, forty second verse, I think. Okay, let me see. Okay, yeah, so it's first forty yeah, first Corinthians fifteen forty six. How be it that which was not first that was how be it that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural. That's the word, not earthy, but natural. And afterward that which is spiritual. Now, of course, this is talking about our body, right? And uh there's this natural body that's sown, and then there's a spiritual body raised. But we apply this also uh, prophetically. Now, the first man is of the earth, earth, earthy, and the second man is the Lord from heaven. And as is the earthy, such as are they that are also earthy. And as is the heavenly, such as they, they that are also heavenly. So there's this, this, tre this symbol of what is earthy and what is spiritual, what is earthy and what is of heaven, heavenly. So the principle here is that when we first understand Bible prophecy, we look at its application as it as is being applied in, in its historic application. And then we can see that we can apply the spiritual application. So we have the fall of Babylon, right? Literal of Babylon is going to fall. The river Euphrates is going to be dried up, right? It's going to be redirected. Cyrus, you know, he's going to enter, his army's going to enter into the middle of the city through this dried up Euphrates, and the two leaved gates will be open, right? 
That's going to be Daniel chapter 5, the fall of Babylon. So at the end of the world, when we have the fall of Babylon, we're going to have the river Euphrates dried up. Is it the literal river Euphrates that's going to be dried up during the seventh or the sixth plague, during the seven last plagues, the sixth plague specifically? So the river Euphrates is going to dry up. It, are we looking for the literal river Euphrates drying up? No. Yeah, so that the kings of the east can come, you know. No, we're we're not, right? Now, many people, Adventists, say, oh, the river Euphrates is drying up. So that somehow has something to do with Bible prophecy. Right. Right. And which which gold, it does. And the Golden Dome or whatever in Jerusalem, Islam and Israel. They're, they're what, applying what, what, it literally. Yeah, well, they're applying all of these nations and everything literally, like even Seventh-day Adventists, right? So, so they don't understand that we can't, that we can't take these prophecies and now apply them in a literal way. You know, we don't talk about Babylon as being, you know, Iraq. Babylon is the kingdoms of this world, specifically, you know, we can, Talk about Babylon, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. But we have mystery Babylon, the mother of harlots, you know, the Catholic Church, right? So they're symbols. It doesn't make sense to take the king of the north and to look at uh, Syria and the king of the south here and say this is Egypt. Because those kingdoms have passed on, right? Greece is no longer there. Right. Rome conquers Greece. Rome becomes the king of the north. The papacy inherits that title. The king of the south represents these characteristics. That then we would have to look at what nation has those characteristics. So as, you, as you'll see in Uriah Smith's, he's going to have three different powers here. France with the king of the south, Egypt, pushing at him. And then the king of the north, Syria, in this case, really Turkey, uh, coming against France. And that this is at the time of the end in 1798, right? So th there's going to be a number of problems with this. But he is just reiterating Josiah Lich's uh, understanding of this. So it's not something that he created. Okay, Dwight, you got... Yep. Uh, okay. So hopefully that clarifies things for people, but we'll, we'll go through this in more detail. After a long interval, the king of the south and the king of the north again appear on the stage of action. We have met with nothing to indicate that we are to look to any different localities for these powers from which, from those which, shortly after the death of Alexander, constituted respectively the southern and northern divisions of his empire. So as you're saying, Smith has had no original thought. He is just parroting that which he had found previously. Mm -hmm. Is it a fact that at the time of the end, Egypt did push or make a comparatively feeble resistance while Turkey did come like a re resistless whirlwind against him, that is, the government of France? So Smith asked a question here. How do we see this? Did the, did Turkey come against France as a whirlwind? In 1798? 1798 or 1799? Well, I mean, the time of the end is, is 1798, as he points out. Well, okay. So. We have already produced some evidence that the time of the end commenced in 1798. Yeah. And no reader of history need be informed that in that very year, a state of open hostility between France and Egypt was inaugurated. The downfall of the papacy, which marked the termination of the 1260 years, and according to verse 35, showed the commencement of the time of the end, took place on the 10th of February of 1798, when Rome fell into the hands of Berthier, the general of the French. 
on the 5th of March following, Bonaparte received the decree of the directory relative to the expedition against Egypt. May 3rd, he left Paris and set sail the 19th with a large naval armament containing 40,000 soldiers and 10,000 sailors. July 5th, Alexandria was taken and immediately fortified. On July 23rd, the decisive Battle of the Pyramids was fought, in which the Mamelukes contested the field with valor and desperation, but were no match for the disciplined legions of the French. Murad Bey lost all his cannon, 400 camels, 3,000 men. The loss of the French was comparatively slight. On the 24th of July, Bonaparte entered Cairo, the capital of Egypt. Thus, the king of the south was able to make but a feeble resistance. Okay, so a couple of little problems. So uh, pushing is not a resistance. Right. Right. So when we deal with pushing in Daniel 11, verse 40, what what is the the imagery there? What what would what would it mean to push? Well, if you compare it to what how Daniel used it previously Mm -hmm. in chapter eight, when he's Mm -hmm. discussing Media Persia. Yeah, it's like a victorious surge. I would describe it as. Is conquering and continuing to conquer. Right. So so Egypt is not attacking France in 1798, correct? Egypt isn't pushing. No. Right. France, France, is, France is pushing. <laughs> yes. The okay. Egypt basically comes, tries to resist, but basically yeah. has a brick wall. It doesn't impact doesn't push France one iota. Exactly. So so it'd be hard to say that the king of the south, Egypt, pushes at him, him being France, um, because that doesn't happen. But we do have France pushing at him, him being the king of the north, and the king of the north being the papacy. Right? Okay. So, so this pushing... You know, it's it's um, uh, the word itself, 5055, is in Daniel 8, verse 4, right? So the, the ram's going to uh, push, right? So that's the ram conquering, um, i got to look at it. So uh, pushing westward, northward, southward, right? So that's Media Persia conquering its territory from Babylon, right? I think Lydia and Egypt. Okay, Nubia and Egypt. Okay, that's so that's, that's but the point is that's pushing. It means to push or thrust or gore, right? So I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that that word is feeble resistance. So he just, he just says, oh, it's feeble resistance, pushing. And, but, but it d- doesn't make any sense for what, what he's describing historically. Okay. Okay. So at this juncture, however, the situation in Napoleon began to grow complicated. The French fleet, which was his only channel of communication with France, was defeated by the English under Nelson at Abakir. And on September 2nd of the same year, 1798, the Sultan of Turkey, exasperated that Egypt, so long a semi dependency of the Ottoman Empire, should be transformed into a French province, declared war against France. Thus, the king of the north came against him in the same year that the king of the south pushed, and both at the time of the end, which is another conclusive proof that the year 1798 is the one which begins the period. How do we, feel, how do we view this? Is this truly a conclusive proof? Well, definitely not. Um... So coming against him like a whirlwind, um, that that's not really what happens. But anyway, he's going to go on dealing with this whirlwind part. Okay. So he's going to compare the, the pushing and the whirlwind, the pushing being a feeble resistance. Now, is this portion relative to Turkey 
also part of what the pioneers had believed, or is this something that that Smith is pushing of his own volition? Well, this is this is Josiah Litch. Okay. Right. So this is this is what Josiah Litch taught. It's not what Miller taught specifically, though Miller's. So if we deal with, um, let me see if I can find this here quickly. Well, just read this. I'll, I'll get to Miller's statements here. In a okay. Second. Was the coming of the King of the North or Turkey like a whirlwind in comparison with the pushing of Egypt? Napoleon had crushed the armies of Egypt. He assayed to do the same thing with the armies of the Sultan, who were menacing an attack from the side of Asia. February 27th, 1799, with 18,000 men, he commenced his march from Cairo to Syria. He first took the fort of El Arish in the desert, then Jaffa, the Joppa of the Bible, conquered the inhabitants of Napolis at Zeta, and was again victorious at Jaffet. Meanwhile, a strong body of Turks had entrenched themselves at St. Jean de Acre, while the swarms of Muslimen gathered in the mountains of Samaria, ready to swoop down upon the French when they should besiege de Acre. Sir Sidney Smith at the same time appeared before St. Jean de Acre with two English ships, reinforced the Turkish garrison of that place, and captured the apparatus for the siege, which Napoleon had sent round by sea from Alexandria. A Turkish fleet soon appeared in the offing, which, with the Russian and English vessels then cooperating with them, constituted the many ships of the King of the North. So, it's kind of interesting to to read that viewpoint on this history. Yes. So, so first we say that the pushing, Egypt doesn't push, but to say that it came against them like a whirlwind. I mean, I, I don't see a whirlwind here. No. Right. I mean, one is we see. So he says here, you know, like a whirlwind in comparison to the pushing of Egypt. Well, obviously Egypt didn't really push. So he's going to have this February 27, 1799, with 18,000 men commenced his march from Cairo to Syria. So I don't know. I don't, I don't see, I don't see how he fits this in. You know, uh, I mean, he's got the many ships of the King of the North, but you know, again, we, we would have to understand this all symbolically. We wouldn't take this in a literal sense. Okay. Because, I mean, is there going to be chariots involved in the literal and horsemen and ships? He, like he's talking about the ships, literally. Horsemen, possibly. Chariots, no. No, right. So, so obviously we'd have to look at these as symbolic. But, I mean, yeah, there's just so many problems with this. Now, just to go back to what um, we were talking about with Miller, here's what Miller says about verse 40. So he's going to talk about at the time of the end. What may we understand by the end? I understand the end of the 1260, right? So which year in power ended as we shall presently show in the year 1798, but we will follow the angel in his prophecy. And at the time of the end, shall the king of the south, south push at him, and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots, horsemen, and with many ships. And he shall enter into the countries and shall overflow many and pass over. It will be necessary for the reader to observe and for me to remark in this place that the inspired writers in their descriptions of kingdoms or principal governments use the pronouns he or him instead of naming them as in the preceding description of Antichrist or as Paul uses in 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 7 and many other places might be named. Therefore, I understand the pronouns in the above named 40th verse and those following in the chapter to refer to the same kingdom or principal ruler of in said kingdom, and that the angel has reference to the principal kingdom of the ten kingdoms into which the Roman was divided when Antichrist arose, which shall hate the whore and shall make her desolate and naked and shall eat her and burn her with fire. If this is correct, then France is intended by the he or him. So he does have France be the he or the him here in this verse. Now, the way that he does that, do, do you understand what, what he's saying here and how he does that? 
it's it's quite a bit different than what Uriah Smith does. Okay, refresh our minds, please. So he says it's the principal kingdom of the ten kingdoms into which the Roman was divided when Antichrist arose. So right. he's still going to have thirty six uh, to thirty nine, referring to the papacy. All right. Okay. But then he's he's going to say, well, this is this is the kingdom of the Roman kingdom, and it's going to be the he or the him in this case is going to be uh, the principal kingdom of the ten divisions of the Roman Empire. So so it's very different in how he he places France here. So your Rye Smith is following the example of Josiah Lidge, but here Miller has has a different view. So they're still going to have the three parties. They're still going to have uh, Egypt and Syria. Now he well, it's his is a little bit different because he says uh, he's actually going to have Spain pushing at France, the Vendean War, and the King of the North here being Great Britain. So. So he's he's actually going to be different in that regard. But he's going to have them coming against France. So he's going to have Spain coming against France and Great Britain coming against France. So he's not going to be using Egypt and Syria. The glorious land he's going to have is Italy. And, and he's going to have Edom, Moab, and the chief of the children of Ammon referred to the Ottomans and Eastern nations, you know, when we get further down. Okay, is that helpful? I would think so. Okay, now, comment from the chat. Thank you, Stephen. Smith had France's battle against Egypt on the 23rd of July. Online sources generally give it as being July 21st. So it's interesting the difference in, you know, here is Smith not long after these battles, having a very different date, yet here is other sources currently that are giving a different time frame. Now, on the 18th of March, the siege commenced. Napoleon was twice called away to save some French divisions from falling into the hand of the Muslim hordes that filled the country. Twice also a breach was made in the wall of the city that the assailants were met with such fury by the garrison that they were obliged, despite their best efforts, to give over the struggle. After a continuance of 60 days, Napoleon raised the siege, sounded for the first time in his career a note of retreat, and on the 21st of May commenced to retrace his steps to Egypt. So, what do we see here? We see that Napoleon was able to be defeated, but did Islam, Turkey, truly defeat him, or did Napoleon make a strategic decision to withdraw? Yeah, and and definitely, I mean, this isn't the fulfillment of the prophecy. So so one of the things that that we have, have addressed that we've understood by studying Daniel chapter 11 is that uh, or Daniel's last vision is that Daniel is being given an understanding of the 2520 prophetic mirror. Yes. Right. He's being given the, the time of the end and also uh, uh, the time appointed. Right. So we have the time of the end, 1798, the time appointed, uh, October 22nd, 1844. And he's also given the fact that there are two times of the end, that there's going to be a repetition of the history of 1798 in the future, which we put as 1989. So this movement is built upon this understanding of Daniel 11, verse 40, that the time of the end in 1798 and the time of the end in 1989 are being described in that verse. And that the repetition of Millerite history that Jeff first discovers in 1989, as he continues to study, he comes to realize that that, that actually began in 1989. 
that it, the, the parable of the ten virgins being repeated, you know, having been fulfilled in the past, will be repeated to the very letter. So she, Ellen White says, has been fulfilled and will be fulfilled to the very letter, right? So it has been fulfilled in the past, and it's fulfilled in our, our time. <coughs> so there are people in this movement who are in, in Africa, I understand, uh, struggling over this. Um, they, because people reading Uriah Smith, some people are taking the side of Uriah Smith. And we know that Jeff is sending money uh, for this. Well, he sent money and helped organize this camp meeting where they had this discussion. I don't know what the result of it was, thinking that the discussion was over something else. But really, they're studying this, trying to understand this, or different people trying to promote their views. I'm not sure exactly all the details. But we know that this is the foundation of this message. So... If this is wrong, if Uriah Smith was correct, then this message has no foundation. But also, we can see that it is really the foundation, this understanding here, of Millerite history, which was sealed up and now is unsealed in our history. And, and we've seen that. We've seen as we've gone through Daniel chapter 11 that this repeat of history is described before verse 40, right? So we have that in verse 35. And some of them of understanding shall fall to try them to purge them to make them white, even to the time of the end, because it is yet for a time appointed. And so we, we tied that together with that, that, um, that history, right? And then uh, of Millerite history, and that it's, repeated that word yet is is talking about a repetition so so anyway it's just it, it's here i understand why uriah smith has this view he's just repeating what he has understood from the pioneer writings but he's he's chosen josiah lich over miller right and maybe you know and he's not telling us this he's not saying that well josiah lich and miller had a different view but, you know, part of that's just not the way that things were done then. I mean, we do things differently now. We're a bit more thorough in that we're, we're showing people what, what has actually happened, what, what different views exist, and why we take the position that we do. He's just sort of presenting his view that he understands. He entitles his chapter, A Literal Prophecy. Right. And he basically just continues that for the whole chapter. Mm -hmm. And um, we know that it has more of a literal application. We don't see so much symbolism. And therefore, he thinks it's just the whole way through. There's no real symbolism. It's just telling you the events literally. Yeah. So he starts with that assumption that it's all just literal all the way through. But we can see that it can't be. And, and it's kind of difficult to to um, to take that position that he does because that's different than Miller. Miller is not going to say, "Well, the king of the south is Egypt and the king of the north is Syria," right? He's going to have the king of the north being Great Britain, which is kind of odd, and the king of the south being Spain. But we have good reasons why the king of the south is um, spiritualism, right? Which, which we then would say is in the time of the end embodied by France, right? It's, it's Sodom and Egypt because we have that comparison in Revelation chapter 11 with France. And the king of the north being uh, the papacy, we definitely have clear that this is a battle between the king of the south coming to, pushing against the king of the north, the papacy, and then the papacy coming back. Plus, we have the other fact that um, Louis F. Weir in the 1950s and 60s clearly understood what Daniel 11 verse 40b was, how it was going to be fulfilled, N not as to the time, but as to how. And so in 1989, when the Soviet Union fell, we could clearly see 
that Louis F. Weir was correct. He, he didn't label at the time of the end, but he still was correct that Daniel 11, verse 40b was fulfilled by that event of the fall of the Soviet Union. And he predicted how that was going to come about, an alliance between the United States and the papacy. Um, well, he, I don't know if he explicitly sort of connected with the United States, but he said certainly Christendom. So maybe in, certainly including the United States. No, he does actually say the United States in one place. Right, okay. Yeah, he does specifically talk about the United States. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I'm not, I can't remember if he calls it America or the United States, but, but he does. So, because he, he wrote a, quite a bit about it, but at different times, right? So, where do you get the one where he just talks about Christendom? Which paper is that in? Um, I think that's something about the King of the North. Yeah. Yeah. So there's another paper. Because um, there's quite a few different. Uh, there's Kings from the Sun Rising. I'm trying to remember which one it is. It could be in the Woman and the Resurrected Beast. Anyway, he's got he's got a few different papers. I'll, I'll find the statement so that we have it. Okay, go on, Dwight. And he shall overflow and pass over. We have found events which furnish a very striking fulfillment of the pushing of the King of the South and the whirlwind onset of the King of the North against the French power. Thus far, there is quite a general agreement in the application of the prophecy. But now we reach a point where a difference of opinion exists. To whom do the words, he shall overflow and pass over, refer? Now, it's interesting, in, the, in all of the studies and all of the comments that we've had on this previously, how this point is so convoluted by Smith, to France or the King of the North, is that to whom he shall overflow and pass over, referring. The application of the remainder of this chapter depends upon the answer to this question. From this point, two lines of interpretation diverge. Some apply the words to France and endeavor to find a fulfillment in the career of Napoleon. Others apply them to the king of the north and accordingly point for a fulfillment to the events in the history of Turkey. If neither of these positions is free from difficulty, as we presume no one will claim that it is, absolutely, it will only remains that we take the one which presents the fewest. Now, Smith is overlooking a lot of situations here. Now, comment in the chat. Someday in the not too distant future, the forces of atheistic communism will be temporarily subdued by the combined forces of Christendom. Preparing for the close of probation by Lewis F. Weir, 1957. Yeah, so that's the quote Stephen's thinking of. Right. So Smith is giving a tacit reference to Miller's rules, but it's very indirect. It's almost like saying, yeah, this is a way of looking at it, but there's a better way. So here we stand today. In our understanding, we have come and are addressing this from the point that Rome establishes the vision. Thereby, Rome is the king of the north. If this is the case, then it is the atheistic nation that has progressed from Egypt to France to Russia that would then be the king of the south. But Smith is not seeing it in that regard. His premise is that the king of the north is to be Turkey and the king of the south is to and remains as Egypt. I have difficulty with what Smith is presenting. Where do the rest of us stand? Okay, so now I know that Smith is going to have some unique ideas as he starts to make predictions about events that are going to happen based upon that he believes that this is Turkey, right? So he's saying that that's going to provide the the fewest 
difficulties, right? That, is that what we understand? That it's right. Going, that's what I would see. Yeah. Now, um, so some had taken this as being referring to France um, or the King of the North. Now, right, of course, the King of the South, he's not applying. People who applied for the King of, of the South, some people apply the King of the South, I believe, to Islam or something. I'm not sure how they do that. Uh, there's so many different interpretations of these verses floating around. But people bring in Islam. I'm not sure how they bring Islam into this. You know, that, that is, I've seen different views. But some people will have Islam as the king of the south. Anyway, we, we, we see that this can't possibly be correct. It's also really a, if there is, if, if there's difficulties, what does Miller say? You know, if we find that, that everything doesn't fit, then we have a wrong interpretation. Right. Right. So Smith should maybe see that there's a problem with this interpretation, that everything hasn't fit perfectly. I mean, if, if you were, um, you know, a computer programmer and, and you had these two programs to operate and one has a bunch of errors in it, the other one has a bunch, but you're going to run the one that has the least amount of errors. Um, I don't think that that would uh, be wise. You would have to have something that's free from errors, right? But you'd hope so. So here, what we have what we have tried to do is we've tried to have no contradictions in God's word to what we see happening prophetically. So he's saying basically there's just two positions, right? And that one of them must be right. And we have to take the one that has the least, the fewest difficulties. So he's, he's going to address, of course, those points. Okay. Now Smith continues. Respecting the application of the prophecy to Napoleon or to France under his leadership, so far as we are acquainted with this history, we do not find events which we can urge with any degree of assurance as the fulfillment of the remaining portion of this chapter. And hence, we do not see how it can thus be thus applied. It must then be fulfilled by Turkey, unless it can be shown, one, that the expression of the king of the north does not apply to Turkey, or two, that there is some other power beside France or the King of the North, which fulfilled this part of the prediction. But if Turkey now occupying the territory which constituted the northern division of Alexander's empire is not the King of the North of this prophecy, then we are left without any principle to guide us in the interpretation. And we presume that all will be agreed that there is no room for the introduction of any other power here. The French king and the king of the north are the only ones to whom the prediction can apply. The fulfillment must lie between them. So Smith's premise, then we are left without any principle to guide us in the interpretation. It drips of ego. That Smith is right and others are wrong. Well, I don't know about the ego part, but uh, but yeah, definitely Smith is wrong. The position on which he is standing that he's trying to build up is not really on the solid ground. Yeah, and 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 that's and and the way that he he builds his arguments is really a problem that I have with Smith. And and I had this problem when I read his book on, on um, the state of the dead. So this was yeah. a long time ago. When I was first an Adventist, I read his book. Can't remember the title of it, um, you know. But uh, I just didn't like the way that he presented his arguments. That it was, it was, you know, as I've said before, highly polemical, very argumentative, little bit um, condescending, a um, bit of mockery here and there, right? Which I don't really think is suitable in presenting Bible truth. I mean, God can mock if he chooses, right? But I don't think it's up to us to mock. Okay. Right? I mean, God can mock the wicked and, and so forth. But as human beings, I don't think that we, we're in that position to mock, to put ourselves above others. And and so so the way that he presents his arguments are not, they're not 
They're not open and clear. They're not left for us to decide. He's using rhetorical tools to sort of uh, push you to agree with him instead of just presenting the evidence and allowing you to uh, dispassionately uh, evaluate the information and make a decision. And, and, and a lot of times it's just how he frames the information that, that you're not even aware sometimes that he's doing it. Here he's, he's framed it in such a way that he's given you a, a false dichotomy, two different choices. And, well, you're going to have to pick this choice because this one's the better one. And, and like here he says, but if Turkey now occupying the territory which constituted the northern division of Alexander's kingdom is not the king of the north and of this prophecy – then we are left without any principle to guide us in the interpretation, which of course is not true, right? Right. We do have a principle to guide us in the interpretation, and and that is we we understand these things to be figurative because they're at the end of the world. The literal has now become typical. The king of the north in the battle and the king of the south, in the battle between the king of the north and the king of the south in Greece, become symbols, right? And and we've seen that, you know, the battle of Raphia, the battle of Paneum, that is the battle of Raphia is typifying Daniel 11, verse 40a, and the battle of Paneum is typifying Daniel 11, verse 40b, right? That's why the king of the north and the king of the south are being described there. It's tying you back to that history of the battle between the literal kings of the north and south, right? Okay. That's the best way to understand Daniel chapter 11, is that we have this previous history of literal kingdoms. So there is a literal aspect to those prophecies, but they are there to be typical of something that's going to happen later in Daniel 11. And, and it's giving us this information all the way through, but those little keys are missed. All right. Two comments from the chat. Islamic King of the South interpreters have Islam entering the chapter in verse 25, referring to the Crusades coming against the Islamic held Holy Land. Second comment. We can get Lewis F. Weir's preparing for the close of probation on academia. Thanks to Theodore. So quite a bit because Weir had a lot of things that that he considered that we have been using within the movement for the last many years. Yeah, yeah it's kind of interesting. Um, Lewis F. Weir's books were republished by Hans K. LaRondell. Okay. Back in the 1980s. So I don't know if people know who he is. I don't. I've okay. heard his name before. Yeah, he's an Adventist theologian, and he writes lots against dispensationalism. But he, he had Lucef Weir's books republished. And because of that, they're actually hard to get on the Internet because they're copyrighted. Hmm. Right. That is, you have to find other versions of it. But usually you just run into Hans K. LaRondell's, you know, LaRondell is like L, comma, H, I, R, you know, LaRondell. Some kind of French name. I don't know how you say it. But anyway, that's that's why they're hard to find. Okay. Smith continues. Some considerations certainly favor the idea that there is, in the latter part of verse 40, a transfer of the burden of the prophecy from the French power to the king of the north. The king of the north is introduced just before as coming forth like a whirlwind with chariots, horsemen, and many ships. The collision between this power and the French, we have already noticed. King of the North, with the aid of his allies, gained the day in this contest, and the French, foiled in their efforts, were driven back into Egypt. Now it would seem to be the more natural application to refer the overflowing and passing over to that power which emerged in triumph from the struggle. And that power was Turkey. We will only add that one who is familiar with the Hebrew assures us that the construction of this verse 
is such as to make it necessary to refer to the overflowing and passing over to the king of the north. These words expressing the result of that movement, which is just before likened to the fury of a whirlwind. Now, thus concludes Smith's commentary on verses 39 and 40. Here, he wants to make reference to a party that is familiar with the Hebrew, but doesn't wish to tell us who it is. He tries to reinforce his position and change things going from one party, France, to another party, Turkey, but the entire premise that he's using is not without issue. And if we're using Miller's rules, this should have been set aside without question. Yeah. Though, I mean, the one that overflows and passes over is the king of the north. Right. Right. Okay. Comment again with the chat. Okay. We we have... uh, Hey, you can get his old Lewis F. Weir stuff on uh, Adventist Digital Library now. Interesting. Yeah. Never used to be able to. So the one book that's really good is The Moral, Moral Purpose of Prophecy. If you click on there. It's not all of his books, but it's some of them. And okay. Any other thoughts or comments? I wasn't. <clears throat> I was looking for that uh, quote by Ellen White. A couple of quotes about Uriah Smith and how she esteemed him as an editor. Unfortunately, I read it in a hard copy book, and I don't have it with me, so I have to put that one on the back burner so I can figure it out in the archives. Okay. Well, as we are coming close to the close of our time together today, I don't know that it's prudent for us to begin looking at the last of these articles that Smith wrote on Daniel 11. Do we have any other comment? regarding what we've covered today. Anything else that we need to to address? Kind of an aside, but <clears throat> last night I had a conversation with a young fellow, and he figured out I was a Christian, and and uh, he said, yeah, I'm, I'm looking at that stuff. And I said, yeah, we've been studying the book of Daniel for quite a while. He said, my friend told me to study that book, or to read that book. I said, oh, would you like to look at it with me? So we're going to be having a Bible study on it. Daniel tonight. And this morning, my roommate, uh, he's, he, uh, somehow the conversation came up. Oh, dude, you only get like three hours sleep. I said, no, it was actually about five. <laughs> and uh said, I've been making a practice lately of getting up at 6 a.m. to join a Bible study every morning for a while. And we've been studying Bible prophecy and stuff, and then I don't know how it got to it, but um, he wanted to know more, you know, like the beast and the mark of the beast and stuff like that. And I said, well, I don't have, it's a long kind of explanation, but basically, and I told him the basics, you know, and, and he was like, wow. So, I mean, it's just incredible the hunger that I find here for for the Bible. They don't really realize it's for the Bible, but it's just such a field that's so ripe. <laughs> it's amazing. Mm-hmm. Well, thanks, Kelly. All right. So if we have no other comments, shall we then close this session in prayer? Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for this opportunity that we've had to open your word, to consider carefully that which has been before us. Be with us now and direct us. Show us, Father, that that you would have us to do so that today we may glorify your name. Bless each one that has been in this meeting. Bless each that have participated. Help us now to look to you as the author and the finisher of our faith for all that you would have us to do. For this, we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.